The top 10 NFL draft slides. The NFL draft is probably the most inexact science we have in sports. You know, one player can be the best pick in the draft to one team or could be a non-starter for another team. One player could be the best player in the draft to Mel Kuyper, but a third round pick or a fourth round pick to an NFL executive. And that's kind of the biggest problem with the draft is that there's three main thought leaders and really only one of them matters. The thought leaders are the fans. So the fans obviously think players are good or bad. The analysts like Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay, and there's a million of them now. And then there's the executives. We really only hear from two. We really only hear from fans on Twitter or on YouTube. And we only hear from analysts like Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay. Mel Kuyper and slash or Todd McShay or Daniel Jeremiah or whoever can tell us blank quarterback is the best quarterback in the draft. But if the Arizona Cardinals are the first overall pick, all that really matters is what that GM or ownership group believes. And there's a lot of different factors that go into that. So we're going to look at these top 10 draft slides, break them down, react. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're enjoying this video of the top 10 worst NFL draft slides. YouTube put a little copyright action on here. So at some parts of the video, you will see just a thumbnail, just a still image. Do not be alarmed. It will go away. So anytime that there was a copyright conflict, the image pops up. The video is good. It's an hour long video full of golden tidbits. So I didn't want to scrap the video. So this is kind of a workaround. I know a lot of y'all just listen to the audio anyway. So on your Sunday fun day, think of this as kind of a long form discussion of the 10 worst NFL draft slides. Thank you for watching. Back to the video. Mark Jackson's still on the board. Brady Quinn is still on the board. Johnny Manziel is still sitting there. Why is he dropping like this? And which teams might take him? He's just starting to run out of options. He might Ooh. slip out of this first round. I had to wait five hours. It was a long day. What better way to start this list than with... All right, so we're starting with Geno. So Geno Smith, good player at West Virginia. Quarterbacks are interesting because quarterbacks are very fit-driven when it comes to the draft. There are certain teams that just can't draft a quarterback you know if a really good defensive lineman slides like let's say you see a defensive lineman who's supposed to go third overall but because of an off-field issue the day before the draft he starts sliding at a certain point basically every team can draft him every team can say there's just a ton of value here we can find a spot for him we always need more defensive linemen and any team becomes a landing spot for a quarterback i don't care how good the quarterback is Certain teams just flat out can't draft them. Certain teams, like let's say, uh, let's say Caleb Williams. Let's say Caleb Williams slides in this year's NFL draft, and he gets to the Chargers pick at five. The Chargers aren't going to draft Caleb Williams because they have Justin Herbert. They have two hundred fifty million dollars tied into Justin Herbert. He's the face of the franchise. The Cincinnati Bengals aren't going to draft Caleb Williams. They have Joe Burrow. You know, the Kansas City Chiefs are not going to draft Caleb Williams. It doesn't matter if he slides into the fourth round. They're not drafting him. They have Patrick Mahomes. It'd be a waste of a pick. It'd be a waste of a roster slot, right? So quarterbacks can slide further because there are huge gaps. We're going to see that, I'm sure, in this. Because I would assume the number one is going to be Aaron Rodgers. I mean, that's that's got to be... He is the... Aaron Rodgers and Lamar Jackson are like the two poster childs for a draft slide. And Rodgers was a great example where he could have went one. But if he didn't go one, the next team that was a possible fit was all the way down in the 20s so that just shows you how a quarterback can slide a little further one of the best redemption stories in football from a draft day slide and a subpar start to his career geno smith was dealt a bad hand but after his 2022 comeback player of the year campaign he turned out to be anything but a waste of a pick as a top QB prospect in 2013, Smith was slated to be the first signal caller off the board in many mock drafts. Instead, the West Virginia product was faced with a nightmare draft slide. If he gets past the Raiders at 12, he might slip out of this first round. He's just starting to run out of options. With the QB needy Bills picking at 16, draft experts believe this was the last chance for Smith to be selected. The draft expert quarterback thing is a perfect example, too, where... Draft experts are going to think, look, we have to put a quarterback in the first round. You know, like they're thinking we cannot mock draft. Like this uh, two years ago, the Kenny Pickett, Malik Willis, uh, Desmond Ritter year, that's what happened is that they were sitting there looking at those quarterbacks like none of these guys are really good, but we kind of have to put quarterbacks in the first round. We can't, we can't release a mock 
without quarterbacks in the first round. So all of a sudden, you saw Malik Willis having a first round grade, Desmond Ritter having a first round grade, uh, you know, Kenny Pickett obviously having a first round grade, and then all of them slid to like the third round. And that shows you a huge distinction between what the mock drafters were doing, basically forcing themselves to do, and then what NFL execs believed. ...in the first round. You haven't heard Geno's name with Buffalo in a very long time. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm told, Rich, the organization is, is really not big fans of Geno Smith. I'd be shocked if that happened. The Buffalo Bills select E.J. Manuel. Quarterback out of uh, Florida State, I believe. Quarterback, Florida State. The first quarterback taken is not Geno Smith. And as day one came and went in unprecedented fashion, Smith remained in the green room until round two. Geno Smith had a very long first night. The West Virginia quarterback is back for night. That's got to be so bad. That's got to be brutal to go to the draft, have your family there, and you're waiting like five, six, seven hours, and you don't even get taken. That's, that's got to be. I, there's no way I would go to the draft. Unless I knew I was like a top three pick. I would have a party at the house or whatever, but I, there's no way I'd sit there and go through this. Number two. The Jets are getting ready to pick Ian. There's been a lot of buzz about a possible quarterback. Is it Nassib? Is it possibly Geno Smith? New York Jets select Geno Smith. Oh, 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 oh. To be brutally honest, I think he fell about where he should have. Absolutely power move with the polo sweater over the shirt and tie with the collar outside of. I mean, this is. This is financial modeling 101 right here. This is a J. Crew fall catalog look. I love it. Vaughn, based on what his tape tells me, there are four or five games they're not even worthy of a fifth round grade. It's a dream come true for me to uh, finally live out my dream, and you know the work's just beginning for me. Ten NFL seasons later, and Smith's career is summed up perfectly by Gino. Gino is a unique situation, and, and it's not really the case for Gino. But I think it's better for quarterbacks or it's not better, but I think it is beneficial if quarterbacks do slide because then they, they are a better chance of falling into a good situation. Top-rated quarterbacks usually go to a top-five pick. Top-five picks usually are given to the worst teams in the NFL. It's usually a bad situation. But if quarterbacks slide, all of a sudden now good organizations are able to take these quarterbacks once they get like the second, third, fourth round. And then also, if you're taken with the second-round pick, third-round pick, fourth-round pick, you don't have the pressure on you to play immediately so you can sit back, develop. So sometimes sliding can be better for the player. It does hurt their bottom line. It does hurt their dollars and the contracts they can sign immediately, but different story. By this viral quote. They wrote me off. I ain't right back, though. Bar. The heated debate heading into the 2006 draft was about which quarterback was the better prospect. Between Vince Young, Jay Cutler, and Matt Leinert, all... 2006 would be a draft where if I was to look back on my time as a young sports fan, uh, I would have got this so wrong. I I mean, I would have been 2006, so I'm like 17 years old. I'm right at the height of like my real sports fandom where I'm reading Sports Illustrated every day. I'm watching literally every game on TV. I'm watching nonstop sports. This is where it really, a little bit before this, but this is like the peak of that. Like, okay, I'm a sports guy. I've always said, now we're on a tangent here. I've always said, fellas usually go in two directions. They usually become a car guy or they're a sports guy. And then once you make that distinction, that, that's usually it. I made a distinction early on, sports guy. Uh, so I was all in on sports. You know, it, it, and it usually comes with a package. Like sports guys are usually also wrestling guys who are usually also video game guys. It, it, you know, it's, it, I can, it's a whole different time for a different day. But the 2006 draft, I thought Matt Leinart was the greatest player ever. I thought Reggie Bush was the greatest player ever. I thought Vince Young was the greatest player ever. Like these, they had college superstars everywhere. And I would have been wrong on quite a few drafts. All three had their respective upsides, but only one had a Heisman Trophy. Considered to have been the first overall pick had he left USC after his 2004 season, Leinart made the questionable decision to stay an extra year. People will question, Corey, whether he should have come out last year and been the first draft pick in the entire draft. But after the Tennessee Titans decided to- The craziest, and I think, I think he passed, so RIP, but uh, Javon Sneed, I believe was his name. Someone double check me. He was supposed to be the first overall pick. He was quarterback at, at uh, Ole Miss. He was supposed to be the first overall pick, or at least like a top 10 pick. He stayed 
and his draft stock fell so far. I don't even think he got drafted. Someone, again, go double check me. I'm pretty sure he did not get drafted and ended up working construction, or last I heard, and I think he passed during that, like while he was working construction. Not on the site, but like during that time period. That was the craziest like decision I've ever seen from should you go and be drafted high or should you stay, try and boost your draft stock. But uh, Liner, like Liner is the kind of guy where if you look at him, he was left-handed, but he's the prototype, he's like a Carson Palmer type where it's the prototype for that time, the prototypical NFL quarterback mold of this is this guy looks like an NFL quarterback. He looks like he can play the position. And Matt Liner just never worked. To make Vince Young their quarterback of the future with the third overall pick, the QB debate began to intensify with just two prospects left. Jay Cutler, it gets there more quickly. He's got the bigger arm. You notice one thing about Matt Liner, a lot of times he has to have perfect anticipation in terms of leading the receiver because his arm strength, as Mike alluded to, maybe is not considered elite. With draft experts calling his arm strength into question, Liner faced the issue of becoming the last man standing in the green room. He is still in the green room waiting to hear his name called as he's going to drop further down. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure Liner, is Liner the next one? I'm pretty sure Liner went relatively high. I, I'm pretty sure Liner was a top 10 pick. I might be wrong here. I know the Cardinals took him. If I had a gun to my head, I would guess Liner went like 7th overall. Or maybe even like, I would say he was a top 10 pick to the Cardinals. This NFL draft. QB needy teams were initially hesitant to trade up for either player, but luckily for Liner, a team out west ended his slide. The Arizona Cardinals select Matt Liner, quarterback, USC. You never want to be that last guy in the room. It's been difficult. You know, I try to, try to keep your head up. And, ten? And... Yeah, t top 10 pick. I mean, that's not that big of a slide. It's always interesting with the arm strength thing because the field is the same size. You know, like, how can you be so good in college? on the field that's basically the same size, but your arm strength all of a sudden is like that weak or whatever that it's not going to work at the next level. I understand. I understand why. Like, I understand you have to throw the ball. The ball is to get there quicker because defensive backs are better anticipating. They're better at reacting. You know, they're faster, better athletes. I get all that. I understand. I understand the actual physics. But it's crazy that that never comes into question in college. Like, these guys can be dominant dominant in high school and college and then and sorry if you hear sirens new orleans downtown new orleans i live in gotham city it's like this day and night try sleeping try sleeping like this okay just sirens blasting non-stop uh it's like that scene in seven if you ever seen the movie seven where the rail the train comes through the subway comes through and shakes the apartment it's like that with the uh with the sirens here but it's crazy that you can go dominate college, dominate high school, dominate college. You get to the NFL, it's like, oh man, noodle arm, can't do it, can't make the throws. Like what the hell? Did, we didn't see this at all. But I mean, Cutler, you know, Cutler obviously had an absolute rocket laser cannon. So crazy, he went to Vanderbilt. I'm, I'm pretty sure as I was like his only offer was Vanderbilt. You realize that there's really nothing you can do. It's out of my hands. I did everything I could, and I think it's a blessing. It's going to be awesome. Plus, the West Coast, you know, it's fun. Despite not well, having awesome. the same kind of success in the NFL as he did in college, Leinert's drop still provided enough draft day drama to warrant him a spot on our top 10 list. Eh, I don't know about that. From 2011 to 2017, nobody caught more touchdowns than Des Bryant. Over his NFL career, Bryant blossomed into one of the best receivers of his time, but before he became a pro, the former college All-American experienced a hefty draft day slide. Issues with Bryant's character surfaced during the pre-draft process, but despite the narrative surrounding him, the All-American wideout was still expected to be the first receiver taken. Denver, which started I, think, I think character concerns are relatively unfair. Uh, because I think most of the time they're leaked by other teams or they're leaked by people with a, like they're, it's like, it's like playing chess and playing checkers. And it's sad that sometimes players have to get involved or have to be, you know, have to take the hit where it's costing them millions of dollars. It's changing their entire life or whatever it may be. But I really do believe that a lot of the times, anytime you hear a character assassination situation in an NFL draft setting, it's probably been leaked from a team that wants to draft that player and they're trying to, devalue the stock 
They're trying to leverage stock. They're trying to leverage the draft. They're trying to leverage trades. They're trying to do all that. And I, I just think it's ridiculous a lot of the time. At 11 and then moved down to 13 and then moved down to 24. It's just popped up to 22 to take who? I don't think it's Dez. Yes. It could be Dez or Demarius Thomas. The Denver Broncos select Demarius Thomas, Georgia Tech. Demarius Thomas, wide receiver, Georgia Tech. With Denver I'm passing level the when it comes in to favor this. of Demarius Thomas, it was clear who'd be the next receiver taken if one were to come off the board soon. Do y'all hear this? I mean, what the hell is going on? Is the city on fire? This is crazy. I and mean, what what what's taking place? Ooh, another one, Jimmy Clausen. I would have got that wrong. Jimmy Clausen, I was all over. I thought Jimmy Clausen was going to be the man. Confirmed, he was not the man. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say the next two picks in this draft are Des Bryant to the New England Patriots, paired with Randy Moss. Are you kidding me? Trey, here we are. The Dallas Cowboys have just is. left up. Des Bryant. The Dallas Cowboys select Des Bryant. Jerry, I don't think you've ever gotten over some of the things that Randy Moss did to the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, there was the infamous... Uh, Dallas Cowboys didn't draft Randy Moss. Randy Moss made them pay for it his entire career. When he came in that stadium, Jared doesn't want to make that same mistake and let this guy, this kind of talent, get away. He's going to have to grind him off the field now. you got to work hard with him off the field. If you do that, you've got a pro ball wide receiver. Bryant proved the doubters was wrong really by becoming the next was great really, Cowboy really wide receiver to wear the famed number 88. The New England Patriots select running back Curtis Martin. Boy, if he's healthy, he's... All right, this is before my time. It's going to be hard for me to offer much on Curtis Martin's draft slide, but a little, little before my time. Real good. Some honorable mentions. Curtis Martin's Hall of Fame career ultimately renders any pre-draft concerns surrounding him irrelevant. The Pitt Panther was an intriguing prospect coming out of college, but durability issues caused Martin to free fall. Scouts said he could have been a first round pick if he had stayed an extra year, but New England took him with the 74th and the rest is history. Oklahoma State's Thurman Thomas should have been a top draft. Thurman Thomas, same thing before my time. Year before I was born. Draft pick coming out in 1988, but his draft stock plummeted after suffering a knee injury in college. Buffalo was willing to take a chance on him with their second round selection, and boy, did it end up paying off. The knee thing is always interesting with running backs. I mean, we, we've seen it before where, I mean, even like Willis McGahee, where you basically have to ask yourself, like, are we willing to take the risk that he rehabs or whatever for the next year, 11 months, whatever, depending on the knee injury, and he can be close to 100%. That's tough. It's very difficult. But I think there is a boiling point in the draft where once they get past a certain point, it's like, well, the value has dropped so far that now there really is no risk. In a year in which Heisman Trophy winners bookended the first round of the draft, who could have expected a future MVP of the league to drop to the 32nd pick overall? With Lamar was a huge slide. Like I said, he's probably the top two, I would say, of a draft slide. But what people forget is that the Ravens, who liked Lamar enough to draft him, the Ravens passed on him. The Ravens selected him with their second first-round pick. They selected they selected uh, Hayden Hurst, I believe, tight end, with their first first-round pick. So even the team that ended up liking him enough to draft him said, eh, we'll take the chance on losing out on Lamar Jackson to draft this tight end. That's crazy. With four quarterbacks taken in the first 10 picks in 2018, Lamar Jackson was hoping to become... I mean, some of these players are pretty solid. You know, like, obviously not Josh Rosen. But Lamar is a good... Uh, he's in a good example of a scheme player. And I'll give the Ravens credit. I've always given John Harbaugh credit for this. When they drafted Lamar Jackson, they com and they decided to go with Lamar, they completely changed their team, completely changed their roster completely changed their scheme, their strategy, how they their philosophy, their philosophy, everything changed. And that is the only way, that is the true way you're supposed to do do it when you when you take a, a like a first round quarterback. Too often you see people draft like Reggie Bush was a good example. When Reggie Bush got drafted by the Saints. The Saints said, "Reggie, you got to fit our scheme." 
We want you to play how Deuce McAllister played. We want you to play how, whatever, Pierre Thomas is playing. What they should do is say, if we're going to take Reggie Bush second overall, we need to change what we're doing to fit Reggie Bush. We need to get him involved in the passing game. We need to throw screen passes. We need to let him return kicks, return punts. We need to do all that. Make him as good as possible. How many times have we seen a quarterback who runs the who runs around or who who is great with their legs or whatever? All of a sudden, it's a little different nowadays. But all of a sudden, it's like he's going to be a pocket passer. So this guy's never done that in his entire career. He he was great in college because of his ability to run or his ability to, to do whatever. And if you see certain players like Cam Newton. Cam Newton was dominant in the NFL because he was allowed to play how he did in college. If they would have told Cam, hey, man, you can't run anymore. We want you to be a drop-back passer. It's just like a carrot. This is a crazy metaphor. But Carrot Top, the old comedian with uh, props, he used to, he, that was like what he was known for. He used props. The big joke with Carrot Top was that once he got big enough to get put into movies, they took away all of his props. And it's like... He's not going to be funny. His whole career has been based on these props, and then he finally gets big enough to where you put him in a movie, but you take away all of his props. So, of course, he's not going to be funny. It's the same with these players. So, good for the Ravens that they stuck with this with Lamar, and it obviously panned out two-time MVP. But if they would have drafted him and said, hey, Lamar, we want you to play like you know, a, a drop back passer. We want you to pl- we want you to play like Joe Flacco. Wouldn't have worked. I'm the fifth QB selected in the first round, but as teams started passing on him, the hope began to dwindle. We have a trade. Saints moving up to 14. Tell us about it. Two possible targets. I give you one Louisville quarterback, Lamar Jackson, who was in the Saints. So the Saints, as a Saints fan, Saints two times. The Saints were rumored to be in the quarterback. This is right around the end of Drew Brees. And twice, the Saints were rumored to be looking at a quarterback. And both times, I was on record saying, don't draft these players because we're still trying to win with Drew Brees. We we do not want to start the, the clock on moving away from Drew Brees. Those two quarterbacks were Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. We were rumored to be in the Patrick Mahomes market, and we were rumored to be in the Lamar Jackson market, and we didn't take either, obviously. And, uh... You know, who knows what would have happened, but... It's building and they love. I really believe that it's going to be quarterback Lamar Jackson. The New Orleans Saints select Marcus Davenport. Oh, oh wow. Defensive end. But New Orleans passing Damn. on Jackson Texas was only the tip of the iceberg. Lamar Jackson's still on the board. Where could Lamar Jackson potentially land in this draft? The Bengals, the Ravens, the Saints, we thought were doing it. They didn't do it. And the Patriots. I just don't see Bill Belichick going with a quarterback right here in Lamar Jackson. When they were having these conversations, Baltimore was, what would our offense look like with Lamar Jackson? Exactly. With insiders linking. And that's the whole thing. Like, And, and you really can't fault... You really can't fault a franchise for not taking Lamar here if they're not willing to do that. If they're not willing to change their entire scheme, if they're not willing to uh, to go all in on this idea of what the Ravens now look like with Lamar, then then yeah, you're not gonna. He's he doesn't fit the scheme. He's not a scheme fit. So cert, certain teams like I, I think it comes down to that answer. Like if you're if you're in the it's hard. If I was a GM at this time or in the front office of a team at this time and I'm I'm not willing, you know, that would have been the question. It would have had nothing to do with Lamar as the player. It would have been, am I willing to change my entire full offensive philosophy? And I mean, depending on the team, like it's hard, it's hard to do that. And two potential teams to Jackson, the question remained, why are teams passing on him? I think a couple things hurt him, to be honest with you. He didn't time in the 40 at the combine. He didn't time in the 40 on his pro day. And I felt that when you're going into your pro day, you play to your strengths. And his strengths is his ability to run. There's times where he stares things down. He doesn't see underneath coverage. He struggles in the pocket when that first look isn't there. With the picks flying by. He's gotten so much better passing. I mean, him him passing, like, another shout-out to John Harbaugh and the Ravens. But, man, he is a dynamic passer now. He's not – he is not – they – they aren't they aren't the prototypical like passing tree kind of offense, but man, they've got him so dialed in as a passer. Lamar Lamar is as dangerous 
with his arm nowadays as, as he is with his legs. Really, really, really impressive what he's done uh, with his arm. Time was running out in the first round. That is, until Baltimore traded back into the first round to grab the final pick on day one. Makes sense. I, I would jump up and down if this is who it is. The Baltimore Ravens select Lamar Jackson. Wow. Quarterback. It's a risk. It's a gamble. No question. Perfect we talk about electrifying perfect, upside. Perfect a little bit organization. The pass game. What? But this is a great example. He, like Lamar falls to one of the best run organizations in sports. If he goes to whoever Cleveland was the first overall pick this year, if he goes to Cleveland, I mean, he he's probably not in the league. Because at that time, uh, I think Freddie Kitchens might have been the head coach in Cleveland. Or maybe it was still... Someone double-check that. Freddie Kitchens would have been involved right around this time. So L- Lamar would not have done well if he got taken by Cleveland because Cleveland would not have had the forward-thinking ability to to do what Baltimore did with Lamar Jackson. Could you have done differently that you could have gotten out of that room quicker? Nothing. I'm happy to be a Raven. It don't even matter. Five years into Lamar Jackson's career and one MVP later, it's safe to say that the teams who didn't see it in 2018 are kicking themselves today. Yeah, no doubt. In 2007, quarterback Brady Brady Quinn became synonymous with draft slides. Brady Quinn's another one where you watch him in college, you're like, man, this guy might be... This guy might be a perfect like NFL quarterback. He kind of seems like the guy who could take that next step and be a uh, franchise quarterback. And it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy he wasn't better because I mean I guess we'll we'll hear it here. But he is a guy where if you watch him in college, you're thinking like this guy does seem like what you would want in an NFL quarterback. A slight debate surrounded Quinn and fellow top prospect Jamarcus Russell over who was the best QB in the draft. Jamarcus is such a crazy. Uh, there, there needs to be so many th- side sidebar. I played blackjack with Jamarcus Russell at the Golden Nugget Casino in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, it was a five dollar table, so you know, it's a tough, tough look for Jamarcus. But Jamarcus, he's the same. Like hindsight's twenty twenty. But if you're a GM, how are you? Like he is the greatest pro, one of the greatest prospects of all time for the time. He is absolutely generational. He is something no one had ever seen before coming out of LSU, like his physical makeup, his arm, everything. You know, we've seen big arms, but we've never seen also the frame and he was athletic and, you know, what he could do at LSU. And then all of a sudden you start hearing about how he can throw the ball 85 yards on his knees, like just insane stuff, insane stuff. So Jamarcus, and I I believe to this day, it is a, It is a popular opinion that Jamarcus Russell had the greatest pro day performance out of any prospect in the history of the NFL draft. Raiders, who picked first, had their hands full. I know we keep talking Russell, but does Russell give them the best opportunity to win right now? Russell and LSU's Sugar Bowl beatdown of... I was there, by the way. I was at this game. I was at this game, so I was was probably... What did they say? 2006? Is that what they said this was? When was this? I don't even know. But... uh, 2007. So I was uh, going in my senior year of co- uh, high school, and I would, me and a friend of mine lived. I lived in Biloxi, Mississippi. My dad took us to this game, uh, and on the way, he got us a daiquiri, and we both got the daiquiri. They were called Cajun Stings, and first time I'd ever had like a New Orleans daiquiri or whatever. Cajun Stings are like a po- very popular flavor. Like a lot of, the, I think they're called a, uh, they're called something else now like Octane 190 or something like that. But it's 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 real. It's real deal Holyfield. And I was loose as a goose off of that daiquiri. By the time I finished the daiquiri and got into the Superdome and watched the Sugar Bowl, I was lit up to the moon. To the moon. But uh, great, you know, great performance by Jamarcus in this game. Uh, stacked Notre Dame team uh, in, in the Superdome. Great trip. Quinn and the Fighting Irish might have swayed the minds of NFL teams over who was the better prospect. When he thinks he's got to really drive the football to his outside, he loses power and accuracy. That was ugly. With that, that narrative ugly unfolding, Oakland decided to choose the guy with the cannon for an arm. With the first you got to take Jamarcus. No Oakland doubt about Raiders it. Have to select Jamarcus Russell. No doubt about it. With Russell off the board, the attention of NFL teams should have all turned to Quinn, right? Well, not so fast. 
Cleveland Browns select left tackle Joe Thomas, Wisconsin. The Browns passed on Quinn, and unfortunately for Notre Dame's golden boy, the fall didn't stop there. Brady Quinn is still on the board. I think that's. I don't think Quinn. I, I want to say Quinn got taken relatively high too. Like, I mean, he's not going to fall until. I don't believe he fell to like the thirties. I don't think he had like a Lamar Jackson slide. And honestly, I, I mean, I, I don't. I might be remembering it differently, but I don't think he was ever going to get taken first overall. I, mean, I think it was always going to be Jamarcus. Somewhat surprising to both Minnesota and Miami. Judging by the look of Brady Quinn, I think it's surprising to Brady Quinn that he's not uh, <laughs> you know what, been though? taken yet also. Miami sat at pick number nine with many thinking the QB needy Dolphins would take Quinn, ending his draft day nightmare. You don't have a secure quarterback situation. One thing that's always surprised, a flash blew my mind. One thing that always surprises me about these slides is like, dude, do the quarterbacks not have a better communication with the with the teams? You would think the teams are throughout the draft draft process. The teams are telling them like, "Hey, if you're there, I'm t- we're taking you." You know, I, I always thought it was surprising that the players really have no idea what's going on because you would think there would be so much dialogue between them and the teams throughout the process. I think it's got to be Brady Quinn right here. The Miami Dolphins select Ted Ginn, wide receiver, Ohio State. Quinn was baffled, but to draft experts, the reason was more apparent than most thought. He does have occasional accuracy issues. He's not a natural thrower of the football. Maybe he's dropping because this guy is, in some people's mind, a product of the system, and maybe people feel he's been almost maxed out, or what you see is what you get. But as the end of the day drew near, a trade began to develop. The Cleveland Browns have been calling around the... But this is, this is also kind of how it was back then, where... You know, a good team, their starting quarterback was just supposed to be an NFL ready guy. And we did sh- see a big shift in that with Alabama. Alabama quarterbacks kind of started that shift where, you know, the John Parker Wilsons and the uh, Brody Croyles and the AJ McCarrens and uh, players like that, where they are obviously just kind of game managing the system, even like Setson Bennett for Georgia. Once we saw those teams start to dominate, it kind of got away from the hey, the best quarter, the best team's quarterback has to be a top ten pick. Now, it's predominantly like, that's kind of the dominant mindset is that just because you are the starting quarterback for the best team doesn't mean you're the best quarterback. Whereas in Brady Quinn's time, it kind of did. You know, the, the best the best team's quarterback was going to get taken highly, whether he was physically good or not. League trying to move up into the first round to try to snag Brady Quinn. The Cleveland Browns select Brady Quinn. Yeah, Brady, yeah, so Brady got taken 22nd overall. So I, I didn't think it was that big of a slide, uh, but yeah. Quarterback, Notre Dame. After waiting over four hours and 10 minutes in the green room, Brady Quinn is about to come out on the stage. Look at that face of a, a relieved young man. How did you feel back there in that green room? I never anticipated things going the way they did. Um, you know, I, I figured nine would probably be the stopping point. And, and you know, once the, the Dolphins, uh, you know, picked Ted again, I, I really wasn't sure what to expect. I'm happy to be the place that I wanted to be in. It's crazy, though, to think about. I, I've always said this, too, when it comes to the draft. Imagine if, like, jobs did this, like normal jobs, not NFL teams or whatever. But imagine if you just graduated college, you put your name in a hat for a position, for a job, you had your resume, whatever, and then anyone could call you and draft you. Like, you, you didn't have the opportunity to say no or yes or whatever. And, like, Brady Quinn, I'm not sure where he grew up, but, like, imagine he's sitting there and he's about to get, he thinks he's about to get taken by them at Miami Dolphins. And he's sitting there going like, okay, you know, I can, I can move to Miami. You know, I can buy an apartment right there on the beach. You know, what's my life look like? I could, you know, living on South Beach, playing for the Dolphins. They're teal and orange, you know, this, this, and this. Then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute. Now I'm talking about moving to Cleveland, Ohio. Like, what's my life look like there? I got to get an apartment in Cleveland. What's life like in Cleveland? It's crazy to think about how hard it is for a college-age kid. You're talking about 21, 22 years old. To get just picked up, to pick, no matter where they're from, and say, okay, well, you're this team's player now, so you got to move to blank city, whether you like it or not, and start a life there. You could be there for three years. You could be there for 20 years. Who the hell knows? You know, it's just insane how some of it works. Like Tom Brady. Tom Brady, 
he gets drafted by the Patriots, I'm I'm sure he never would have thought, yeah, I'll I'll still be here in 20 years, whatever. Like this is my home. This is it. I don't have a chance to move back. I don't have a chance to do whatever. It's just insane to think about the human implications of a draft pick. It, it everything it, every it determines everything. It determines where you live. It determines more than likely where you're going to meet your spouse. It determines where your kids are going to go to school. Like who it, it's it's it seems like a fun wrinkle, fun little part of the of the league, but it's nuts the human side of it. People talk about losing money. I, I never had that money. There you so go. How can you lose it if you never had it? Although scouts and experts were proven right in their assessment of Quinn that his accuracy was suspect and couldn't rise to the occasion in big games, at least he got a chance to don the jersey of his home state team. Okay, so he's from Ohio. That's interesting. So he, that's that's pretty. I, I had no clue. I no clue where he's from, but. Uh, so that's interesting too that he was just fell to basically play where he was from from one Browns QB to the next you can't talk about draft day slides without mentioning Johnny football Johnny is the poster boy for media versus like front office Uh, Merrill Hodge this is infamous now where Merrill Hodge basically went one on one with Skip Bayless and Skip Bayless was saying Johnny should go first overall to the Texans. And his reasoning was ridiculous. His reasoning was ticket sales and jersey sales, and he's from Texas. He played in AM and all that sort of stuff. Merrill Hodge is basically saying, like, he not only is he not the first overall pick, he doesn't he shouldn't even be a first round pick. He, his film is terrible. His physical skill set is terrible. It's not gonna work. And that was a that, that this is the definition of the media loves him. He's a superstar. But how good is he? How good actually is he? Tim Tebow is kind of like this, but Manziel had a higher, I think, peak of celebrity status than Tebow did. And the fact that he was even argued to be a top 10 pick, with the, or a top, the first overall pick with the skill set that he had, is insane. And I think Johnny fell to 22. I believe that's where he ended up falling, to Cleveland. But you know, when you look back at it, it's like, it is 100%, 100% based on just star power and his like mystique. And when you see a player like Lamar and a player like Johnny, Lamar had so much more coming out of college. I mean, Johnny physically, he wasn't that fast. He wasn't big. He didn't have a good arm, accuracy or throw power. So when you really look, look at it, it's like, man, this guy d- d- can't really do any of the tasks that we're asking him to do at the pro level. But he's such a big star, maybe he should get taken first overall. That's crazy. As the most electrifying player in the 2014 draft class, there were plenty of potential landing spots for Manziel, including number one overall to the Houston Texans. The Houston Texans are now on the clock. Could it possibly be Johnny Manziel? The realistic chances of Manziel going number one weren't as good as Jadavian Clowney's. That being said, the QB needy Jaguars were on the clock two picks later, looking to take their guy of the future. Yeah, is this where is this where they took uh oh my god, what was his name? Out of UCF. Blake Bortles. Jacksonville Jaguars select Blake Bortles. Well, there you have it. The first quarterback of this draft selected is not John. As Menzel began to drop after two potential landings. And Bortles was horrible. Bortles was just more of a, like, he can actually play quarterback. He was a bigger, you know, prototypical style quarterback. Lots the hype surrounding him started to build. That would put the Vikings, a quarterback needy team on the clock there at eight. There's been a lot of Tampa Bay Manziel mania mm-hmm. also. The Browns now sit eighth overall. Is this Johnny Manziel? Is this Johnny football? No, they go, uh, they go a cornerback here. Uh, they get, I know for sure they go a defensive back at eight. I can see them. Oh, man. Uh, so it's right there. I want to say Denzel Ward, but I don't think that's right. Browns fans are on the edge of their seats. Will they be getting Johnny I can't, I can't wait for this pick. The Cleveland Browns select Justin Gilbert. Justin Gilbert, Oklahoma State defensive back. Oh! 
Defensive back. Oklahoma State. Still yeah, sitting in the Gilbert. green room, yeah. the attention on the draft Damn. turned to the one Manziel, guy left where, where the hell that mattered most. Johnny Manziel, 10th overall on your draft board, is still sitting there. I'm just going to say it right now. We're in Johnny football watch right now. I'm not going to lie. It seemed impossible that arguably the most accomplished player in the draft, one with a Heisman in his trophy case, could keep falling as he did. While Menzel did have some character concerns, it was his playing style that caused his draft day slot. I think the problem with Menzel was that in college, his biggest strength, his ability to run around, his agility, his ability to, to extend plays and all that did not translate because he wasn't fast. He wasn't fast and he wasn't a great athlete. Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray is the example, or Kyler Murray is what people thought Johnny Menzel was. And Kyler Murray's not that great either. But Kyler, Kyler Murray... His agility was next level. He was relatively fast. He did have a super strong arm. Johnny, same size as Kyler Murray, didn't have a strong arm, wasn't super fast, didn't have great agility, wasn't a next level athlete. So Johnny Manziel was like, if you have Kyler Murray, then I think you have Baker Mayfield, then I think you have Johnny Manziel as far as like their physical skill set. They're all kind of the same player. Kyler is the best of the three physically as far as like they're all the same size. They all kind of play the same way. Baker is a better athlete than Manziel. Baker has a better arm than Manziel. He doesn't have the arm of Kyler, and he's not the athlete that Kyler is. Manziel is like way below both of them. So when you take that away and you add in the character flaws, what exactly are you drafting? Why? I want him to climb the pocket here. It's a clean pocket. Instead... Yeah, college quarterbacks, I say this all the time, but college quarterbacks always escape out of the back of the pocket because college quarterbacks are usually better athletes than everyone around them. So when they escape out of the back of the pocket, they're fast enough to kind of turn the corner. In the NFL, that doesn't work. In the NFL, you want to climb the pocket to escape, not go out of the back. Chase Young, a defensive end at Ohio State, or played at Ohio State, now he's for the Saints. But he was notorious for pressuring the quarterback. He would pressure beyond the quarterback, and a lot of his sacks came from behind. The problem with that in the pros is that the quarterbacks get the ball, get rid of the ball quickly. So if you watch a lot of Chase Young's tape from early in his career, he was running past the quarterback because he was trying to run past the quarterback, hope they're holding onto the ball, sack him from behind, doesn't happen. So what feels most comfortable to him is open yeah, space. That's the problem. We know he's got a ways to go to become a pocket passer. As the first round went on, Dallas's selection at 16 loomed large. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones was smitten with Manziel, and the idea of keeping Johnny football in Texas seemed too good to pass up. <laughs> this is kind of surprising because this is such a Jerry Jones move. Johnny Manziel right now. This place is going to explode. The Dallas Cowboys select Zach Martin. Another hell of a decision. I mean, what a great decision. Though. Zach Martin was a one of the best linemen in the NFL. Pick another pass, but with Cleveland using their overall. second oh, first it. round pick to trade up to number 22, it seemed as if Johnny would hear his name called soon. And here's that chant. And you can hear the chant in the Radio City Music Hall for Johnny. The Cleveland Browns select Johnny Menzel. Quarterback, Texas a &M. How hard was the wait? I was tough, but... Um, I went into this saying I thought whatever team drafted me, whatever team fell in love with me, it would be the right situation for me. While Johnny Football's NFL career was anything but fruitful, his draft day slide provided one of the most exciting moments in draft history. Philadelphia has selected from the University of California wide receiver Deshaun Jackson. More honorable mentions. Thought to be too small and weak for a first round selection. Deshaun Jackson had a sneaky, really good NFL career. Deshaun Jackson turned into one of the most electrifying players to ever play the game. Philly took the flashy playmaker in the second round, and Jackson has put those concerns to rest throughout his career. The St. Louis Rams select Steven Jackson running. Steven Jackson out of Oregon State, really good player. He kind of got into a perfect storm where he became an NFL running back when LaDainian Tomlinson was showing that running backs could be more than just run up the middle. Whenever Ladanian was kind of pushing, you know, receiving the, you know, becoming kind of a full threat on offense. Steven Jackson took that and ran with it, no pun intended. He started to become a versatile running back and, and kind of helped push the NFL towards 
uh, running backs not just being a between the tackle kind of guy. Running back from Oregon State. A proven commodity at Oregon State, running back Steven Jackson slipped to 24th overall, where the Rams grabbed what became one of the best backs of the decade. Yeah, Jackson he was really missed good. the combine after sustaining a knee injury during his final year in college, which caused his draft day slide to the late first round. Luckily for St. Louis, it allowed them to grab a franchise player for years to come. Warren Sapp's 1990. Before my time too, Warren Sapp, interesting player because in, at the University of Miami and then at Tampa Bay, uh, won a Super Bowl at Tampa Bay. Warren Sapp is one of those guys where I feel like no one really talks about him, but he the the tri, the real NFL analytical kind of guys they put Warren Sapp in there with like top ten defensive players ever, like most dominant defensive players ever. Again, I was I was a little young at the time to really know, but. I don't. I, we might even get to the. We may be at the point where Warren Sapp doesn't get enough respect for how good he was. The five slide was the definition of draft day drama. The Miami defensive lineman went into the first round as a consensus top pick, but his fate was unjustly altered the night before the draft. Their background check by NFL security has produced seven positive drug tests by Sapp. We were still confident going into draft day but we had no idea that he would fall out of the top 10. Oh, Drew Rosenhaus, man. Warren Sapp has never had any multiple tests of that nature. That's a complete untruth. How could I go to the University of Miami, flunk seven drug tests, and nobody know it until 11.30 at night, the night before the draft? Please tell me that. Yeah, see, this is a good example. This is a good example of, especially back then, but when everything was just kind of a handshake. I guarantee you a team leaked this, or an agent or a team or whoever, hoping to get Sapp. I guarantee you, I 100% believe some team, whether they're ninth overall, 10th overall, 11th overall, whatever, said, if we leak this, if we leak this, maybe he'll slide to us. Maybe we can get this player. Especially back then where rumors and conspiracy theories and stuff like that just took off because there was no, you know, it wasn't how it is today where you can fact check things and everything's not as above board. So I would not, I would 100% believe a team leaked it hoping to get Warren Sapp. Yet, despite the stout defense from Sapp's camp, teams were still wary. What happened was, once a couple teams begin to back away from a player who should have been drafted did. higher, yeah. then everybody begins to back away. But as Sapp continued to fall, a certain team's faithful set their sights on the Miami defensive tackle. Bring Sapp to New York, we'll take him. With the uh, ninth pick in the first round, the New York Jets select tight end from Penn State, Kyle Brady. Oh, After another brutal. potential landing spot came and went, Sapp began to lose hope. It was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. And if Brady Quinn ain't sitting there or Aaron Rodgers ain't sitting there until the 24th pick, guess who's the poster child for still dropping in the draft? Me. Two picks later, another team was... I wouldn't care at all if I was in the front office and, and he failed a drug test. I would think he's a college kid in Miami. Who the hell knows? All I know is he can play football and we will get that figured out. And at this, at this, if he's that good, uh, sidebar, Warren Sapp played at, my, played at Miami with The Rock. Warren Sapp has told on numerous occasions, he was, people were like, what's it like to play with The Rock? And Warren Sapp basically said like, he just dominated the rock at practice every single day. Ready to put Sap back on the roller coaster ride again. The Minnesota Vikings have Dennis Green as their coach, Tony Dungy as their defensive coordinator. You couldn't ask for a better player for what they want to do out of three technique than Warren Sapp. With the 11th pick in the first round, the Minnesota Vikings select defensive end from Florida State, Derek Alexander. Ooh. Derek Alexander is a fine player, but certainly was not as high up as Warren Sapp. All hope seemed lost after the Vikings passed on Sapp until the Buccaneers came calling just one pick later. What are you hearing on the phones right now? Well, my phone's ringing right now, so let's see. Let's do it. Hello, Rosenhaus. Lo and behold, 12 picks later, I'm landing in Tampa with 12 consecutive double-digit loss seasons. Only silver lining in a real, real dirty, dark day in my life was that I would be playing 80 miles from my mother's home. Yeah, I was about to say it actually it works out again. You know, he's, he went to goes to Miami, then he goes to Tampa. Can stay in the same area, uh, like he just said. Whatever it was twelve straight double digit loss seasons, but ends up getting a Super Bowl with uh, the Buccaneers. There wasn't no game she missed. I knew that. When it's all said and done, about four or five years from now, 
I'll put my money on Warren Sapp being the best player in the NFL. That statement couldn't have been more accurate as Sapp led Tampa to a Super Bowl title in 2002 on his way to a Hall of Fame career. Randy Moss's draft day slide. Same exact situation where Moss had a lot of off. Moss is, he's a little different now that people, you know, are used to the Monday night countdown, Randy Moss, but he was a very eclectic kind of guy. He was an interesting kind of guy. He, even in Oakland, he was in Oakland, like the interviews he would give, he was, he's a beat, a beat to his own drum kind of guy. So, you know, I could see where a 19, 20 year old version teams thought, who know who know he's, he's at the University of Marshall like a lot of a lot of questions but same thing when when you're drafting for a an athlete like this and you have someone that jumps off the page like Randy Moss running whatever it was a 4240 at the level that he can play i think you have to take all the off field stuff and say i do not care just like Warren Sapp i don't care what he's doing i don't care that he's staying up late i don't care that he's failing drug tests i don't care about that stuff we will try and fix that because the most important thing here is that he's got the football thing figured out. So I, if I was a GM, I would never, ever let this kind of stuff get in, get in my way. In 1998, will haunt NFL teams forever. The generational talent with unparalleled athleticism had all the makings of a future superstar heading into yeah. the draft. There was just one issue. Do you take a risk and just go with him because he's a great football player? Yes. Or is there a red flag? If you're no. going to invest the first round pick in a player, there better not be any question marks in regard to his past performances off the field. You have to err on the side of caution because uh, it can be very destructive to your salary cap. Moss's slide began to ramp up as the Dolphins couldn't acquire the seventh pick from the Saints in hope of drafting him. One pick later, the Cowboys passed on him as well. This was history right here. This is where Randy Moss always makes a point to talk about was the Cowboys passing on. The Dallas Cowboys select mm. defensive end from North Carolina, Greg Ellis. Despite the challenging time for Moss, there was still hope for his first round draft status. Vikings hoping to learn from history. In 95, they wanted Warren Sapp. Tony Dungy was pounding on the table. They passed on him, regretted that later. The Minnesota Vikings have selected wide receiver from Marshall University, Randy Moss. But imagine if the Vikings would have got Warren Sapp too. Like imagine if it's like, yeah, okay, we'll take Warren Sapp. Oh, yeah, okay, we'll take Randy Moss. Like, If you see a big grin in Minnesota, it's Brian Billis, the offensive coordinator. He's got to be grinning ear to ear. In what might be the luckiest moment in Vikings history, one yep. of the best receivers ever fell into this. And he was immediate. His rookie year, insane. His rookie year, I think he had like 20 touchdowns. Rookie year was nuts. Air lap and took the league Didn't by storm the following season yeah. as only Randy Moss could. The 1983 draft boasted what most consider the greatest quarterback class ever. While John Elway went number one overall to the Colts and Jim Kelly went 14th to the Bills, one more future franchise quarterback was still left on the board. I believe Marino, I believe Marino slid because of some off-field party uh, rumors. A record six QBs were selected with Marino being the last to go. People were questioning whether you know, I was going to be, you know, good enough to be, you know. I think he was a bit of a partier. Good player in the league and all that stuff. So what happened? There were rumors about him in Pittsburgh that he was a party guy. And, uh, you know, that's why he dropped. Quarterbacks continued to fly off the board at an unprecedented God, pace. I'm good at this. The Marino slide continued with Jim Kelly and Tony Eason drafted at 14 and I mean, 15 Kelly was respectively. Sweet. On top of the erroneous rumors, a subpar season at Pittsburgh had NFL teams looking more at what was wrong with Marino rather than what was right. You know, I threw more interceptions than I did touchdowns. And that was because of a couple games that I, you know, threw a lot of interceptions in games. One was Penn State, I think I threw five. And, uh, you know, after you throw three, what's the difference? When Marino's... I think that's a good point. Like, a lot of the times... Again, back then, when it was a little more crude when it came to draft prep, like you would look at the results. Like you would look at that that exact kind of thing, where oh, you threw this many interceptions in this game. At, at a certain, once you get to the draft, who cares? What does it matter if you beat Penn State? What does it matter how you played against Florida or whatever? Like all that goes away. The accolades, the awards, the wins, the losses, the record, all that stuff goes away. What matters is your physical tools and your and your emotional makeup, and that's it. 
And the emotional makeup is kind of hard to judge because you're talking about 19, 20, 21 year olds that you're about to give a whole lot of superstardom and money to. You never know how that's going to play out. But you know, Marino obviously had a physical makeup that was was unmatched. I mean, his arm and, and what he could do uh, at the quarterback position. So the idea that they were like, ah, well, he threw more interceptions and touchdowns at Pitt, that's crazy. As hometown Steelers were up at 21, there was hope that Pittsburgh would take the player they had been so enamored with ever since he was the starter at Central Catholic High School. Alas, Chuck Knoll decided to continue rebuilding his defense instead. As the first round dwindled to the final five selections, the Jets were on the clock at pick 24, needing a quarterback. New York opted for the little-known talent out of UC Davis, Ken O'Brien. With two picks left in the first round, Don Shula and the Dolphins took their chances on the pit QB. The Dolphins select what? I mean, that's crazy. That, that, to me, is the craziest slides is whenever the same position is taken above them. It's one thing, like, for the Aaron Rodgers or, or whatever slide where it's, it's like, yeah, he slid to the 20-something pick, but there wasn't seven quarterbacks that got taken ahead of him. Like the fact that Tony Eason or whoever these quarterbacks are, this guy that the Jets just took, like they're getting taken over Dan Marino is bananas. Quarterback, Dan Marino of Pittsburgh. Ironically enough, Marino's draft day slide to Shula and the Dolphins couldn't have put him in a better situation as he became one of the most prolific passers in NFL history. Marino throws for a touchdown and there's the record. Breaks the all-time NFL record. Number 32 overall, the San Diego Chargers have selected quarterback from Purdue, Drew Brees. At six feet tall, draft experts considered Drew Brees too short. They thought he lacked arm strength, too. While the majority failed to see the potential of the undersized Brees coming out of college, he never doubted his abilities at the next level. The Chargers took the future Hall of Famer in the second round of the 2000. God, what a draft. Jesus. In one draft. Drops back. Looks to the far side on wide open. Traquan Smith. And Traquan Smith is going to go to the what end time zone. to be alive, ladies Drew and gentlemen. Drew Brees has done it. You have just witnessed history in New Orleans. Drew Brees is the NFL's all-time leading passer. Was that against the Falcons? Was that? Because I was at the game. He broke Marino's record against the Falcons. And I was, I was at a lot of his record-breaking games, but I remember that one specifically. Welcome to the 2005 National Football League College Draft. Well, is it Alex Smith? Well, is it Aaron Rodgers' quarterback? Round one. So Alex Smith was a incredible player out of Utah, and he kind of is what I was saying where he ran the option. Like Alex Smith was not a pro-style quarterback. He didn't do that in college, uh, and he wasn't really great in the NFL because Alex Smith did turn into a pretty good player. First overall pick, I don't know about that, but he did turn into a pretty good player. But only once he was able to use his legs, only once he was able to run around and kind of do the things that he was good at. And San Francisco let him do that, Kansas City, uh, and later on, you know. But it's wild that they took, I mean, I guess we'll hear about it, but it's crazy they took Alex Smith over Rodgers because Rodgers was much more the pro quarterback, much more, you know, had the arm, had all that stuff. Alex Smith is much more of the like, okay, well, how are we gonna how are we gonna use this guy? Of the 2005 draft was intense as expected. Coming into the night, headliners Aaron Rodgers and Alex Smith were projected as top picks, but only one could go number one overall oh, to the San Francisco oh, 49ers. Right San Francisco 49ers select Alex Smith, quarterback Utah. We felt that Aaron was probably uh, ready to play sooner than Alex was, but in the end, we were kind of saying with our developing team, we felt a little bit that Alex may be the little better in the long run. Could it have been anyone else but Aaron Rodgers to end up as our number one draft slot? You know what's kind of funny about Rodgers? So he played at Cal, obviously, uh, and at the time, was it Jeff, Jeff Tedford, I think, was the coach? But all of their quarterbacks, like I guess they made them do the same thing, but they all held the ball like really high. like That was like a Cal thing. And it's crazy now when you see Rodgers, like he doesn't do that, you know? So you could tell that that was instilled in him at Cal, hold the ball basically up here. And then once he gets to the pros, they completely change his throwing style, which is why I always say if Rodgers would have been taken first overall and thrown right into the NFL and forced to start immediately, I think he would have been a bust. I think he needed the development that he got in Green Bay. And uh, yeah, he just wasn't ready. He was not ready 
to play out of Cal. Physically, his tools were nuts. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, maybe one of the most physically gifted quarterbacks of all time. But at this point, he had not put together enough of a foundation to use those tools. Fight of all time. On that fateful night, the Cal prospect sat in the green room for roughly four and a half hours. You kind of joke with the guys in the green room on the bus over, like, hey, who's going to be the last one in there? You know, we all thought we're going top 10. Well, it's not that funny when it's you. Spurned by his hometown 49ers, Rodgers began the free fall of all free falls that evening. A lot of people did not have Aaron Rodgers as a top 10 quarterback. He has flaws. He has blemishes. While the throwing mechanics issue provided the oh, main reasoning is. for Rodgers' slide, another logistical reason was in play. First round contracts at that time were not what they are today. They were onerous. Yeah. And first round quarterback contracts were even more onerous. Teams either didn't need a quarterback, didn't. Yeah, the contract thing was bad. The contract thing got changed. So back then, the first round quarterbacks basically got like $40 million. Definitely the first overall pick. Basically got $40 million guaranteed. Like it was it was nuts. And that's what happened with, I think Jamarcus Russell was the, I think they changed it after Russell because he basically got like $60 million guaranteed. And <laughs> for some players, like, okay, I'm done. I don't really need to do anything else. So they did change how first round quarterbacks and first round players got paid. But uh, I guess during this time they hadn't changed it yet, which is why they were talking about that, the contracts. And have cap space for a quarterback yeah. or had head coaches whose jobs were on the line and probably didn't want a rookie quarterback. Playing in a so-called QB friendly system under Jeff Tedford caused Jeff draft Tedford. experts Boom. to Nailed think it. Rogers abilities wouldn't immediately translate to the next level. They wouldn't have. And that naturally drew comparisons to Tedford's other college prodigies, Trent Dilfer, Akili Smith, and Joey Harrington, among others. With the 24th- I didn't realize Tedford coached at Oregon. Hmm. Selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select Aaron Rodgers, quarterback from California. Some things are definitely worth waiting for, an Aaron Rodgers, quarterback at it. Yeah, I mean, perfect, perfect landing spot for Rodgers. Perfect. I mean, Green Bay, obviously this time, they had Favre. Kind of crazy they, they took Rodgers, but, uh, you know, there's, there's all kind of other stories about how the Packers and Favre and their relationship. So, but just, uh, I mean, it's one of those things where it's the top, it's the number one slide, but it could not have set either person like Rogers or the team in a better trajectory. Just amazing how, I guess like with Marino, you know, where it's just, Marino might've been able to play right off the bat though. It might not have mattered as much, but Rogers needed the years. He needed the development. I think even he needed the chip on his shoulder. He kind of needed to fall. He might've needed that to, to kind of become the person that he is. Rogers emotionally and the way he talks now and the way he you know carries himself, a lot of that is chip on the shoulder. I'll show you. I'll prove you wrong. And a lot of that might have been started right here in the green room. What a video. Good Lord have mercy. An hour long. Jesus. An hour long. I was not expecting that to for this to be that long. But a lot of golden tidbits in here. If you made it to the end, you are an absolute hero. Go down in the comments below. Let me know if you made it to the end. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. That will not be an hour long, I promise.